we know that there are other correlations between, I'm sure some of you who are astrologers have thought about some of these correlations yourself, like you can, you can also think of like Saturn, for example, as being the first chakra because it has so much to do with the Earth and, and matter, and, and Venus can be a really good correlation with, uh, with the heart chakra, I and mean, you, can, you can think in Mars would be like a really good correlation with the, uh, the third chakra. But I'm trying to think in just in terms of the whole general domain of the lower three chakras as we talk about the whole general domain of the heart is Neptune and then the ball here as, as you are. Okay, so, so the first, in this um, kind of second part of the talk, that'd be kind of like the first part of the talk is about the body and the energy centers. So the second part of the talk is about modern history. And the, the basic thing that I've been drawn to and I've been studying for several years now is the historical correlations with the discoveries of three outer planets. And um, Western astrology gets its best results from uh, studying the, the cycles and the transits, uh, the cycles in history, and the transits in people's individual lives, uh, as well as the aspects in people's natal charts. Um, gets a lot of powerful, interesting results from these outer three planets, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And, these three planets weren't even known, we didn't even know they existed, uh, until the modern period. So they're all a new discovery, and they all tell us something interesting about modern history and about the evolution of consciousness in the modern period. So in this part of the talk, I just want to review those three discoveries and talk a little bit about the correlations uh, with them. And what's different about the discovery of the three outer planets is that the, the discovery moment is a unique event. Uranus will never be discovered again. It was just discovered once in 1781. Neptune discovered just once, 1846, and uh, Pluto in 1930. So it's so the um, the study of the discoveries of the outer planets is somewhat different from the study of the of the cycles of the planets, the world transit tr world transits that uh, uh, Rick Tarnas has done in Cosmos and Psyche. Because in the, in those cases you have precedence, right? You can say, oh, what was uh, the Neptune um, Uranus conjunction in such and such a date like as it compares to this other one. And so you can do these comparisons across history. Well, you can't really do that with the discoveries. So, um, so the discoveries are these unique moments in history when, uh, and so I think that the discoveries have a certain kind of potency and numinosity because it's a one-time one event. <coughs> so let's start with the first one, uh, discovery of Uranus in 1781. And uh, the Iranian Promethean archetype Astrologers have correlated that archetype with uh, freedom, liberation, uh, accelerated change, dramatic changes. Elementally, it's correlated with light and electricity, and uh, freedom, independence, and individuality. Also, really strong correlations with this with this archetype. Uh, it also sometimes gets correlated with immaturity, kind of a youthful, kind of teenage kind of quality to it. In contrast to the the sober, mature, slow-moving Saturn, or sort of more the immature, youthful, teenage Uranus. So this is a well-established correlation, astrologers know this. So the idea is that with the discovery of each planet, it's as if those archetypal qualities came forth in the collective psyche in the historical period. And so, like one really good example uh, that I like with each of the discoveries of the planets is what was going on in physics. And at the time, in the uh, uh, 18th century, in the 1700s, starting around 1740s, 1750s, a little bit before the planet was discovered, science, and particularly science of physics, was totally curious about electricity. Like, how does it work? How does static electricity work? And, you know, Ben Franklin's out there flying his kite, you know, and he's kind of trying to figure out the connection between lightning hitting his kite and, and uh, electricity. And what is the connection? How do we understand it? So it's just interesting that the science of the time reflects this archetype itself, right? kind of electricity and light and energy. The first, um, the first battery was invented shortly after uh, the discovery of Uranus uh, by um, Alessandro Volta. And so we get the word voltage and volts from, from the, the person who invented the first battery. And what was significant about that is when they invented the first battery is they could actually have electric current, right? They could kind of store electricity, right? Kind of capture it and store it. So we can have it as an energy source, right? The battery itself. So at the time, um, 
At the time of the uh, French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the decades surrounding the discovery of Uranus, uh, there is uh, the word revolution takes on a new meaning. And the word revolution takes on the meaning of dramatic, exciting, progressive changes, right? As opposed to just one thing after another, cyclical changes. Because it's kind of interesting that the word revolution, the meaning of the word doesn't match the actual, right? The word doesn't revolve just to go around and around. But we, the meaning that we have ever since Uranus was discovered, when there was the French and American revolutions, the word takes on a new meaning, which is to break out of just doing the same thing and revolving again and again. So the word itself kind of takes on this new meaning that correlates with the archetype. New change, linear change, exciting change, dynamic change, change that breaks out of cycles. So the archetype of Uranus correlates with genius and innovation and uh, individual merit. And one figure in particular of that age is a really good example of this, and this is uh, Napoleon. Because before Napoleon, before the American French Revolution, uh, your name, your ancestry, and whether you own land, and how far back your aristocratic heritage goes, really meant a lot in terms of how far you could get in life. So beginning with the democratic revolutions and the discovery of Uranus, individual merit, making uh, evaluations of a person's capacity to have a job, to go somewhere in his or her career, so on and so forth, comes out of individual merit. And so Napoleon uh, is a good example of this because he wasn't an aristocrat, he didn't own land, he was from Cor Corsica, and he sort of became this uh, non-traditional ruler of Europe kind of overnight, and he was particularly noted for his brilliance and his genius and his electric-like, lightning-like conquest of uh, Europe at that time. So he's kind of a, a figure who exemplifies this Uranian Promethean ener energy. Freedom and liberation. Uh, the, um, so Uranus discovered in 1781 the first citizens' uh, campaign to abolish the slave trade was started in 1787 by an Anglican named uh, Thomas Clarkson in England. And they succeeded uh, 20 years later in abolishing the slave trade. So movements to, to toward liberation, movements towards freedom, to unchain uh, different populations and groups, that kind of thing. So these are some of the correlations with this period, excuse me, with this uh, discovery of this planet. Right? So let's move on to Neptune. Okay? So Neptune was discovered in 1846. And uh, each, what, as I've studied each discovery of each planet and the correlations, historical correlations with each planet, I noticed that each awakening in each case of each planet happened in a way that reflects the nature of the archetype itself. So what I mean by that is that in the case of Uranus, when Uranus is discovered, it's as if history becomes more electric. It's as if history becomes more accelerated. It's as if history... Uh, the correlations with the, that historical period reflect that archetype. Now, Neptune's a very different archetype. Neptune's very subtle, very imaginal, and very intangible, and very gentle. And if you think about the year 1846, I mean, 1846, what the hell happened in 1846, right? It's not a dramatic, it doesn't have that dramatic quality of like the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution and democracy being born. What about 1848? <laughs> yeah, well, that's but that's a correlation with Uranus Pluto. <laughs> so the the correlations, the historical correlations that fit, that are of a Neptunian character, in my read of historical evidence, kind of come in slowly and gently, and not so dramatically and hard to, and they're harder to detect. One has to look a bit harder and read a bit harder and think a bit, kind of between the lines to see those correlations subtly come in and subtly, um, subtly come in, in starting in the late 19th century, and so slowly fade out. And that's so characteristic of that archetype. Sorry, late 18th century? Late 18th century, the correlations start. So the, probably the most recognizable to the, to the average uh, person who's, who's kind of thinking about these things uh, that, that would correlate with discovered Neptune would be the whole uh, period of Romanticism. Romanticism in the arts, romanticism in music and literature, poetry. 
And at the center of, of Romanticism are a cluster of Neptunian themes. Emphasis on imagination. Emphasis on nature mysticism. Emphasis on uh, the exaltation of the arts themselves and an aesthetic perception of reality. Right? These are very Neptunian qualities that contrast with the Enlightenment. So the, the area of the Enlightenment correlates very strongly with the discovery of Uranus. Rationality and reason, confidence in science, strong association with the element of the light. Romanticism, romance, <laughs> right? Love, beauty, heart, heart qualities, imaginal qualities, poetry, right? So you go from the Enlightenment, light with Uranus, to romance, imagination with Neptune. Neptune has a strong correlation with ideals and dreams, utopian fantasies. And the 19th century has a strong uh, quality of idealism, hopes for a better world, hopes for a better society, uh, idealistic dreams, workers of the world unite, Karl Marx said uh, just a couple years after Neptune was discovered. And there's sort of the dream of a classless society. So Neptune governs ideals, so there's a lot of idealism coming into the world in the mid-19th century and the decades and the times surrounding Neptune, but also kind of impractical ideals, right? Communism, the legacy of Marx's communism didn't work out. It was too hard to implement. It was too counter to human nature to be that idealistic, that as if we're going to all drop our individual concerns to live in a classless society. So idealism pervaded the 19th century in several different ways. I thought I'd give you one example from uh, medicine. So the 19th century had, had several really interesting and significant medical breakthroughs uh, that reflected uh, the archetype of Neptune. So one, one example I like to cite is uh, anesthesia. Neptune, the archetype of Neptune has a lot to do with consciousness, states of consciousness, alterations of consciousness, non-ordinary states of consciousness, the capacities that open up, like paranormal and psychic capacities that open up when one is accessing non-ordinary states of consciousness. So there's a whole slew of correlations in the 19th century that I go into in my dissertation with that. But anesthesia is one, one um, uh, potent example for, in terms of how it impacted society. Because if you just think about it for one minute, <coughs> just imagine having, I mean, I'll bet you a lot of people, how many of you have had a surgery in here? Have you had your surgery at some point? Pretty much everybody. Can you imagine having your surgery without anesthesia? Anesthesia, anesthesia was essentially invented in the span of a decade uh, in the 1840s. The, the first demonstrations of uh, both dental and medical anesthesia happened, uh, they basically all happened in that decade, kind of between 1842 and 1850. So all really, really closely around the year 1846 when Neptune is discovered. Could, uh, yeah, could sure. you tell people about the actually pre-chloroform anesthesia? Because it's relevant to this theme, which was then using for surgery. Me, you met me mesmeric anesthesia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sean's pointing out something that I talked a little bit about in the dissertation, which is that for really 50, almost 60 years before Neptune is discovered, so this is going back to the 1780s. Uh, Franz Antoine Mesmer, we get the, uh, the, the uh, verb to mesmerize from Mesmer's last name. In the 1780s, uh, Franz Antoine Mesmer and some of his followers es essentially discovered hypnosis. They didn't, they didn't call it that at the time. They called it uh, magnetic sleep. And so uh, in the 50 years before the 1840s, before um, uh, anesthesia with uh, chemistry, with chloroform or other nitrous oxide, other uh, drugs, Pe the people were doing surgeries uh, through hypnosis, through what was called magnetic sleep. The word hypnosis itself was coined in 1842, really close to the time that Neptune was discovered. So that's kind of what you remind me to point out? Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, yeah, actually, many surgeons at Elliott's in India did amputations, all kinds of surgeries without anesthetic through, uh, through magnetic, um, what we would call transinduction today. Magnetic anesthesia hypnosis. Yeah. So, um, 
Another correlation from medicine that also fits uh, with the Neptune archetype. The Neptune archetype, so the Uranus archetype correlates with electricity and light in, in terms of like an elemental correlation. The element that Neptune correlates with is water and the, and the element and the, uh, the ocean. And so it's very fascinating to me as I was doing my research for my dissertation to see that this, the first sanitation movements start in the uh, 1830s. And the, and the beginning of the awareness of, oh, doctors should uh, wash their hands before they operate on someone. And uh, uh, before this, um, approximately the 1850s, 1860s, doctors would, wouldn't wash their hands between uh, surgeries. So the whole birth of the understanding of sanitation and germs and the awareness of keeping things clean. This was the era of uh, Florence Nightingale. This was the era of the birth of modern nursing and the, and the birth of this, uh, essentially this major revolution in modern medicine, sanitation, anesthesia, compassion. The archetype of Neptune correlates with compassion, compassionate medical care, compassionate care for uh, wounded soldiers on battlefields. The Geneva Conventions uh, is started in uh, the 1860s. So this whole cluster of events, all unfolding around the time that Neptune is discovered, in medicine, in care for soldiers, in sanitation, in drugs, the ability to alter consciousness all sort of kind of flourishes uh, into on the cultural scene. Uh, one last correlation with Neptune before I, I go to Pluto in the 20th century is um, here's, a, here's a fascinating correlation again from physics. So I talked about how Uranus correlates with this kind of period in history when Ben Franklin and Alessandro Volta are kind of fascinated with uh, electricity. Neptune correlates with electromagnetism and the telegraph. Ne the archetype of Neptune uh, correlates with web-like interconnectivity and, and a frequent metaphor that's used to uh, describe the Neptune archetype is the web, right? The world wide web came into existence in the 1990s when the archetype of Neptune was being activated by its conjunction with uh, Uranus. Same thing happened, uh, except not with the internet and computers, but with the telegraph in the 1840s, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that was uh, happened coinciding with the discovery of electromagnetism. So the ability to connect the world in a web of instantaneous communication also was happening at that time you know, around uh, the discovery of Neptune. Okay, so obviously I could say a lot more, but I'll move on to Pluto. So if people want more correlations with the 19th century, I'm full of them. So mm -hmm. let's move on to Pluto, though. So, so the idea with the discovery of a planet is that when a planet is discovered, these correlations are coming forth in the decades surrounding the discovery of the planet, right? A good example is with Uranus and Neptune. And it's not as if they just shut off like a light switch afterward. In a sense, they, they awaken and then this wake keeps going, right? The impact of the Industrial Revolution is still with us. The impact of the birth of democracy is still with us. The impact of the Geneva Conventions of these uh, developments, uh, Neptunian developments I've just described are still with us. So let's turn to Pluto now. So Pluto was discovered in 1930. That's when it was discovered. It was discovered down in Flagstaff, Arizona. I actually went down there uh, a few years back and went to the Sada this old, old, old rickety telescope in this museum down in Flagstaff, Arizona. So if you ever go down to uh, the Grand Canyon, this is, uh, Flagstaff is on the south, south side of the Grand Canyon. You can go see the, the telescope that discovered uh, Pluto. Mm -hmm. So um, Pluto, Pluto for those who are new to astrology, Pluto, the archetypal principle that correlates with the planet is concerned with power, it's concerned with death and rebirth, it's concerned with massive changes deep changes, uh, the underworld, the hidden, the underground, the depths, uh, death, destruction, uh, the regeneration. So in uh, Hindu mythology, the uh, Shiva, right? Shiva correlates with Pluto, death and rebirth on a massive, on a massive scale. Uh, sexuality, eros, kind of life force energy. Biology. These are all uh, correlations, correlates that astrologers have come to uh, associate with Pluto. And 
when, uh, after a planet was discovered, after each, in each case, after the planet was discovered, the way astrologers apprehended the meaning of the nature of the archetype that correlates with the planet happened through studying natal charts. It happened through, stu through studying individuals' uh, birth charts. Uh, in the case of Neptune, I know this is really clear because the, um, the astro astrologer named Alan Leo was um, researching all these natal charts and he had all his astrologer students looking at natal charts to discern, okay, what, how, what's this, this meaning? And it was only later, much more, um, much later actually, that astrologers actually looked back and then said, ah, oh, doy, the actual time that the planet discovered is one of the biggest clues into the nature of, of its principle. So in the case of Pluto, when Pluto was discovered, we didn't know what it meant. But if you look at that period of history, it's again, you see the same theme. World War I, World War II, the massive destruction, the birth of uh, the advent of fascism, the focus on power, such a big theme in the 20th century. Hidden power, displays of power, political power, unleashing the power, the latent power, the hidden power in the atom by splitting the atom, which happened, uh, most of the developments that led to the splitting of the atom happened in the 1920s and the 1930s, right? Who was discovered right in the middle of that. Other, other potent correlations that, that kind of illuminate 20th century history is this whole, whole idea of Pluto having a kind of hidden quality. And, and the, the whole idea of hidden, hidden power has been such a, it's, it's less uh, hidden now, but in the, um, the formation of the Federal Reserve, hidden banking, uh, corporations, so it's like one way you can look at 20th century history and the discovery of Pluto is that the, the idealism of democracy and the idealism uh, implicit in both the Uranus and Neptune archetypes are awakening in the 18th and 19th century and then those ideals and those dreams kind of, kind of get subverted by this Plutonic agenda of power and dominance and um, wars over resources, things like that. Evolution, cosmic evolution, uh, Pluto correlates with uh, the discovery of the Big Bang, right? So the, the discovery of the Big Bang, the discovery of the evolution of the universe unfolds uh, from the time of Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble's discoveries about the, Edwin Hubble is the one who discovered that the universe is expanding, okay? And that led to the idea that, oh, well, if it's expanding, there must be an origin, a, bi a Big Bang, and then that's, that's the science of discovering the Big Bang unfolds over the, over the coming decades. And a sense is confirmed in the mid-60s uh, when this uh, background radiation, cosmic background radiation is discovered in the mid-60s confirming um, the, uh, the ideas of the Big Bang. So this whole kind of awakening to the vast evolution, evolutionary energy of the uh, cosmos. Another interesting correlation in the 20th century that correlates with Pluto is the mysterious, the irrational, and the chaotic. So if Uranus correlated with discovering, uh, kind of being fascinated by electricity, uh, and the, the discovery of Neptune correlates with electromagnetism, Pluto, Pluto correlates with the discovery of the quantum realm, right? This mysterious hidden realm of matter that's filled with, filled with all this potency and all this power if we can split, split the atom. Um, another good correlation is the focus in philosophy on deconstructionism. Uh, Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen, I uh, was noticing on the internet the other day, Bruce Springsteen has a new album out uh, called Wrecking Ball. And it's just like this whole kind of plutonic imagery of destroying things and deconstructing things and bringing things down. And, and uh, in the 19th century, there were these, uh, it was the time of idealistic philosophies, kind of grand metaphysical schemes where we have kind of this grand overview of all of reality. And then in the 20th century, we have deconstructionism. We want to break these grand systems down and destroy them and bring them down into the Platonic underworld. Uh, sexuality, the sexual revolution, that's another strong correlation with Pluto in the 20th century. Pluto correlates with death, so the destruction and the genocides of the 20th century. The, 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 the wide-scale um, uh, genocides all, uh, all over the planet. So the death, but also birth, also rebirth. So the population explosion 
right, going from one billion people on the planet to something like seven billion now, I think there was just a few months ago seven, that's another ver uh, example of Pluto in the, in the 20th century. And then lastly would be the ecological crisis, greater awareness of ecology, of the earth, and um, the imminence of the ecological crisis. So any, any questions about the three discoveries or comments? This would be a good moment to just pause and sort of check in with each other before going to the, the Gebser stuff. Yeah, jump in. I'm just curious if you look at um, any aspects that may have been in alignment at the moment when each planet was discovered, mm -hmm. and, and if there's any significance in, in that. Yeah, there definitely is. I actually have a handout in my bag. Uh, why don't I grab it? Why don't I grab it and uh, give, it, give it to you all? Kind of rushed in and forgot I even had it. So a little uh, footnote to your Mesmer. Uh -huh. Sure, go right ahead. Uh, in, I just want to say, around 1800 maybe? Uh -huh. um, in Paris, a commission was set up to uh, evaluate the uh, the cure is the best one. No, I don't need one. I oh, oh, you already have it anyway. That's right. <laughs> Just trying to think. We might, some of you might have to share. Uh, no? Okay, we got enough. Could you get it? Thanks. And so a commission was set up to um, evaluate all of the mesmeric cures uh -huh. in Paris. Yes. And the, the person that head up the commission was Ben Franklin. <laughs> yes. And, uh, oh, so you, you guys just got one. Uh, here's a second. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the linking of the, the, the Neptunian theme with the, with the, with the Uranus. Uh-huh. It's Ben Franklin. It's a kind of strange link showing up. So, uh, so to answer your question, Matt, one of the one of the most interesting things that happened to me in the course of my research of thinking about these three discoveries is uh, at, at th so there's no I'll put it this way there's no obvious reason that, that when the discoveries happened that they should have happened when they happened. So, for example, Uranus was discovered in 1781. That could have generated a whole lot of excitement in uh, astronomy, right? Wow, we just discovered this new planet. People could have gone out there with their telescopes to discover a whole bunch more, right? Mm -hmm. So Neptune could have, could have been discovered, oh, I don't know, five years later in 1786, right? Could have generated all this excitement. Maybe they would have discovered Pluto like another 10 years later, right? So, um, but as it turns out, uh, Uranus in 1781, Neptune in 1846, and Pluto in 1930. If you look at the, um, uh, the discovery dates, as it turns out, in, in the, at the midpoints between these discovery dates, so just take a look on the map between Uranus and Neptune. Uh, he's, he knows it well. <laughs> he, helped, he actually helped me, helped me come to this realization. There's, you see how there's a Uranus-Neptune conjunction right in the middle there, Matt, mm -hmm. right? And everybody else? Yeah. Um, Okay, then jump forward to uh, the diff the between Neptune and Pluto. There's a Neptune-Pluto conjunction in 1891. Yeah. And then you look down, down at the bottom, there's a, a Uranus-Pluto conjunction, not at the bottom, but a little bit further down, there's a Uranus-Pluto conjunction there in 1851. Okay. So as it turns out, at the midpoint between the discoveries of each planet, there is a conjunction of the two planets involved. In world transit terms. In world transits. Yeah, and there's no weird. obvious reason. Freaky, that's really freaky. <laughs> there's no obvious reason that that should be so. No. Right? It's it's a huge uh, synchronicity from the <laughs> standpoint of view of an enchanted uh, uh, perspective, or it's just a glaring, uh, inexplicable coincidence from a disenchanted perspective. The cosmic arabesque. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, isn't it also right that Saturn was in major? Uh, aspect to all three of the planets when they were discovered mm -hmm. and the nature of Saturn being able to bring it into reality and bring it into mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so in the case of yeah, so in the case of Uranus, yeah, the, so in the case of Uranus there was a, a Saturn Uranus opposition at the time that Uranus was discovered. In the case of Neptune there was a Saturn Neptune conjunction at the time that Neptune was discovered. In the case of Pluto there was a, a, a opposition of Saturn and Pluto. And it actually gets more, more interesting than that because uh, Neptune represents uh, the principle of union and togetherness and merging together. Uh, 
Shortly after Neptune was discovered, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto were in an extremely tight uh, triple conjunction. So it's sort of like Neptune's discovered, and then just a few years later, all three of the outer planets are all kind of merged together in this very tight Neptunian-like kind of conjunction, all merged together in 1851. Uh, when Pluto's discovered, uh, Pluto is much more stressful, much more dynamic, and there's a, a T-square between, a very stressful T-square between uh, Saturn and Ur uh, Pluto being opposed, both square and Uranus, right at the time Pluto's discovered. Mm -hmm. So even the array of the planets, this, so I'm just expanding on what you said, right? It's kind of the same principle of how the sky itself is, is configured in a certain way that, that's uh, synergistic and harmonious with the discovery, right? So Saturn bringing it in to incarnate it, and then I'm just kind of saying you can also see other elements that sort of amplify that. Hi. Oh, hi. I have just a quick question. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere that um, recently, Neptune has taken a prominent position in the sky, and it's going to last for like a good cycle. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Um, oh, I was wondering um, about that in relation to Prometheus, the light bearer. Um, I've seen some correlation with him and Lucifer, and I wonder um, how they relate to the age of Aquarius and um, the regeneration of mystery traditions. <laughs> okay, so all that. And in uh, 60 seconds or less. Oh, uh, and then also on Nikola Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, there must have really been something going on with Neptune and Nikola Tesla, with our like, um, air and Aquarius and electricity and all that. Uh -huh. um, uh, maybe he did that in, but uh, okay. Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll pull out one element of that, because that was a lot, uh, I, and which is, so uh, the, zo the zodiac sign, the, so each planet has a natural affiliation with a, a zodiac sign. And so there are 12 zodiac signs, there are 10 planets, and so each planet kind of lines up, and there's some, in some cases, there's more than one correlation. In the case of Neptune, Neptune, Neptune has a very natural affiliation with the zodiac sign of Pisces, okay? Both have a lot to do with water, both have a lot to do with mysticism, both have a lot to do with losing boundaries, changing consciousness. There's a very strong affiliation there. Neptune uh, was discovered in 1846. Shortly, just a few years after it was discovered, the planet Neptune moves into its natural sign of Pisces. In 1847-48, Neptune moved right into Pisces. When Neptune was discovered, it was in late Aquarius. It was at 26 Aquarius. So it's sort of like the way I read that is that, again, like these other factors that Thecca was pointing out, and Matt and I, and we're all kind of been discussing, it's like yet another example of enchantment, or another example of uh, what I call synergy, which is the idea of two factors working together to reinforce one another. So as Neptunian, and Neptunian events are awakening in correlation with the discovery of Neptune, you could also see it as, oh, Neptune goes into Pisces, it's natural sign, so things are getting more Piscean, more Neptunian in the middle of the 19th century. So now to, to get back to your question, that's kind of laying the groundwork for what's happening right now. Guess what just happened? Neptune just entered Pisces again for the first time since it was discovered. So we, we right now are in the Neptune return of when Neptune was discovered. And in, um, uh, in, in a real specific sense, in one week, we will be at the, the exact Neptune return for the start of a very significant and very Neptunian movement in the 19th century, which was the movement of spiritualism, which was a, a kind of a countercultural movement that emphasized many Neptunian qualities, kind of a communal form of spirituality, seances, communicating with dead, uh, your dead ancestors, angels, spirit beings. It had a very compassionate kind of Neptunian ethos in it. So we're, we're coming back to the Neptune return of that. So does that give you a little yeah. bit of a feel of things? And then maybe we could take on the other stuff at the end of the talk. Okay, thanks. Okay. So do people get the, uh, the idea of there being sort of this kind of grand synchronicity of these conjunction alignments at this point? Because So I've, I pointed that out. I figured that out on my own about the Uranus-Neptune and the, and the Neptune-Pluto one. And I was struck by that. I was kind of like, wow, this is really cool, right? You know, right in the middle. 
And it just started to make sense that as Neptune is awakening and as Pluto is awakening, it would make sense that those two planets would be conjunct right in the middle, kind of synergizing that, reinforcing that. And then I went over to Sean's house here I said, Sean, check this out. And he said, hey, Frank, look, even in the case of Uranus and Pluto, even those two, even those two being so far apart in uh, time, have a conjunction at their midpoint as well. So that was really surprising to discover that. So I've been going for 45-ish minutes. So how do you want me to wrap it up? I could talk about Gebser and just do it really kind of quick, like in kind of a five-minute type thing, or how do you, like, I was really how are people, people huh? I mean, I, because it, we're not a massive audience, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think um, you can take more. You can take a little bit more time? All right, and, yeah. That's okay. Okay. Well, cue me, because uh, I'll go brief, though, because I don't want to talk forever. We can kind of, okay. maybe 10-ish minutes, and then we can really kind of hash it out with Q&A and discussion. And Sounds good. good. Okay, so here was um, a, kind of an interesting moment in my intellectual development. So I'm studying these three planets, right? And I'm getting really fascinated with these correlations and doing my dissertation on Neptune. And then uh, I had been familiar with all the different schools of the evolution of consciousness, different ideas. And, and I started to notice that John Gebser, John Gebser is, uh, for those who don't know, he's a fairly popular uh, thinker here at, at CIIS. And he uh, uh, already was using the word integral uh, 30, 40 years before CIIS was founded, right? California Institute of Integral Studies. Gebser was already thinking and using that term. And he had a, a vision for the evolution of human consciousness. Uh, and he published this uh, shortly after World War II in a book called The Ever-Present Origin. And in this book, he talks about three structures of consciousness. And they are uh, the magical structure of consciousness, which he correlates with our hunter-gatherer phase of evolution. And the mythical structure of consciousness, which he correlates with, with the agricultural phase of our evolution. And then the mental uh, structure of consciousness, which he correlates uh, starting from around the time of, of uh, ancient Greece, uh, leading up to coming up through the Renaissance and even into the modern period. So the, the magical, the mythical, and the mental. And he talks about these as being kind of semi-autonomous structures of consciousness. And so then uh, what I was noticing is that, my gosh, the magical structure of consciousness has a really strong uh, correlation with Pluto. Okay, so for example, uh, the instinctual, the animalistic, the, uh, the vital. Uh, Gebser talks um, about magic in terms of the magical as being that which has an effect, right? If you, magic in the hunter-gatherer phase of evolution had cash value in the sense, magic got you dinner, right? I mean, that's what, that's what you know, magic was at that time, as opposed to magic in the contemporary sense of, oh, I can give you a, a, an entertaining you know, trick of deception or sleight of hand, right? So magic in a different sense, magic in the sense of potency, of being able to do something and so a, a word that was commonly used, uh, excuse me, that anthropologists have picked up from, I believe it's Polynesian cultures, and have now applied it to this time, was, is, the, is the term mana. Mana, and mana meaning power, potency. Like a shaman has mana. Shaman has plutonic-like potency, plutonic-like power to create an effect. Right? So as I was studying the, the correlation, I kept thinking, wow, there's a really strong correlation here. What Gebser talks about is the magical phase is a lot like this kind of plutonic phase, plutonic archetype. Nature, animals, shamanism, um, potency, power, uh, the tribal quality of it, uh, kind of all, all seem to have a, a strongly plutonic quality to it. So I started to think of it as, in this phase of our evolution, uh, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus uh, were like dormant or pre-differentiated capacities. So in a sense, Pluto was the dominant archetype of our hunter-gatherer phase of evolution. And it wasn't as if we were without Neptunian and, and Promethean qualities at that time. We had them, but we had them in a very dormant or rudimentary uh, or pre-differentiated uh, uh, capacity. 
So then as you move out of the magical into to Gebser, what, what, call, what Gebser calls a mythical, uh, the correlation again is really, really strong in my view with Neptune. The title, the title uh, alone is a really strong indication of that because the archetype of Neptune is correlates with myth and story and imagination, imagery. And so Gebser's uh, descriptions of the mythical phase of consciousness, I thought, wow, this is a lot like Neptune. So, so for example, uh, here's a, a sentence from Gebser. He says, Whereas the distinguishing characteristic of the magic structure was the emergent awareness of nature, the essential characteristic of the mythical structure is the emergent awareness of soul. And so again, it's like the correlation with Neptune is really strong there. The sense of the, the human community differentiating out soul from nature, differenti differentiating out soul from instinct. Right? In, in a sense, from an archetypal perspective, differentiating out Neptune from uh, Pluto. Uh, Gebser, uh, other, other ways that Gebser describes the, uh, the mythic structure of consciousness that also correlate with Neptune. Uh, Gebser talks about the myth of, of Narcissus and imagery and the, the, um, the myth of looking in the pond and seeing your image and seeing your reflection. He talks about that as being part of the mythic. Again, that's another strong correlation with the ne Neptune archetype. He, Gebser talks about oceanic thinking as the kind of thinking that correlates with the mythic structure. Again, ocean being another uh, metaphor that's commonly used that correlates with the, the Neptune archetype. So in this mythic phase of our, of our evolution, it's as if the, all of these Neptunian qualities are kind of being differentiated out, they're becoming more um, autonomous from, from the Plutonic base of our tribal hunter-gatherer phase of evolution. Uh, another, another correlation here would be, um, I think as we evolved up uh, from Pluto to Neptune to Uranus, like in terms of, look, think about it, evolution up the, the chakra system, I think that more mind starts to come in. We start to move from instinct toward mind. So I think of Neptune and the mythic as sort of like the first level of mind. And it's mind at the level of imagery, mind at the level of dream, mind at the level of imagination, which is a more primary form of mind than mind at the level of abstraction and mind at the level of discrimination. And so in a sense, it's like going from right, right brain to uh, left brain, right? Because right brain is the dimension of mind that correlates with imagery, while left brain correlates more with ling linguistic, logos, language. So then when you turn to the Gebser's mental uh, structure of consciousness, I saw the intuitive correlation with Uranus. And so, so the, the correlations there would be uh, with um, the greater accent on individuality, moving, moving out from the tribe toward more a greater capacity for individuation. Um, the archetype of Uranus correlates with the human, with the anthropos, with humanity, uh, and uh, the, the Greek emphasis, uh, the famous phrase from Protagoras of uh, man is the measure of all things. Right, so as the mental structure is coming in, one, one again can see various correlations with the Uranus archetype. Um, yeah, so I mean, I could go on and on, but that's the general idea is um, to kind of summarize kind of what I've said so far, and then we can kind of go into discussion is, uh, it seems to me that one way we can think about the integral, right, because at CIIS and in our, the communities that a lot of us circulate in, you get different definitions of the integral, different ways of thinking about the integral. What does it mean to be integral? So integral means integrating east and west. Or integral means uh, integrating masculine and feminine. Right? They're kind of different, different definitions. So I thought one way I could conclude the talk is by saying that the more I've thought about this kind of three archetype scheme, I think it, it's, it essentially offers a, a version of the integral. So to be integral would be to, to awaken and to integrate and to have full uh, operating capacity of each of these energy centers and each of these archetypes in your, in your life. So that, I was thinking that, you know, sort of in a speculative sense of my own sort of ideal education, educational kind of schema would be an educational schema that develops the Plutonic, the Neptunian, and the Uranian Promethean in our, in our human capacity. So, so why don't I stop there and 
we can kind of just kind of go with the kind of discussion. Does that feel good? Yeah. Spell that out a little bit more because I don't know Steiner very well. Well, you know, I'm no expert. We have, we have, uh, we have at least one here. I'm not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I was just produced by it. <laughs> um, so the etheric, the etheric is more instinctual, energetic, well, just, erotic. Well, it's, it's a life, life principle. It's life force. Life force. Okay. Yeah. The, the astral is more like emotional. What? Okay. Soul force. Soul force. Yeah. So it goes. Yeah. So etheric yes. in the in the system that I know, etheric is the, is the sheath that's closest to well, the body. Well, the etheric is what is what makes your body something other than a bag of minerals, right? So the, so the fact that it's Life alive is like there. Yeah. Um, but the um, its responsiveness, mm -hmm. not the body's, but your responsiveness as a living being, uh, active perception and, and imagining and so on. That's more the astral. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which the second sheet up. Yeah, yeah the, the sort of imaginal. And the mental is he, what does he say for the third? The eye. Because the, the eye, eye is uh -huh. self consciousness, reflexivity, freedom, uh -huh. uh, those types of things. Clearly, the eye. And so, those three uh, dimensions or bodies in, 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 this, in the anthroposophical correlate quite nicely with, with these three. Mm -hmm. And even the physical, um, if you want to Saturn. add a fourth planet in there. Saturn. 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 I was just thinking actually um, that with, and I haven't read Gebser, but Gebser's uh, talked about so much here that I've gotten more and more of an idea. And I always find this kind of interesting that we're moving towards the integral, and um, if the integral is uh, a healthy, balanced combination of the first three, mm -hmm. is that the final phase, and are we really in a position right now to say that we're moving into the final phase of humanity? Um, and correlating with the, uh, the three other planets, there's a part of me that wonders, well, there also is a uh, potential, very sad correlation with are we moving into a Saturnian phase next as well. Um, but that could also be a, on the one hand, could be more um, you know, with the ecological crisis, we are seeing this mass extinction, uh, mass death. But on the other hand, it could be moving into a wisdom phase, um, more mature phase, and maybe that is what the integral would look like. Um, so I'm wondering if you thought about it in terms of including a, a fourth planet into that sequence. Well, I left Eris out, and I'm sure you're aware of Eris, and I think that we're just in a super, super speculative stage about Eris. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so for those who don't know, so there's a new planet discovered in January 2005, and then it, was, it, was, it wasn't named until several years later. Well, no, like about a couple years later, a year, a year and a half, a year and a half, that's right. 2006 it was named. Uh, and then it was named Eris. And there's a bit of... Um, of a synchronistic sense with the naming of each planet. Uh, it, it works particularly well with Neptune and Pluto, not so well with Uranus, although one can think of it in a certain way as working with Uranus as well. But in other words, Neptune was not named with uh, an archetypal mythological sense for what the astrological archetype actually means. It was just named, right? Pluto wasn't named, uh, I mean, in other words, both Neptune and Pluto were named by astronomers, not by astrologers. And yet, as it turns out, the, the archetypal meaning fits very well with those, those two. It doesn't fit quite so well with Uranus. So when Eris was named, uh, it's a little bit ominous, because Eris is, uh, in Greek mythology, was a goddess of strife and chaos and fighting, and she was the one who threw the apple into the, um, the beauty contest of, uh, I think it was Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, I think it was those three. And Paris was going to judge their beauty and she, and this fight breaks out because she throws in this apple. So anyway, 
Uh, I've done some speculating about Eris. Uh, I think we are in the age of Eris. I just don't think, I think we all see through a glass darkly right now, you know, to know our own time. Like, so for example, like to think about Pluto, discovered in 1930, I think you really needed to get to about 1960-ish to kind of look back on that period of history and then kind of start to go, huh, you know, what was that whole period of history about? Like, I think we're too much in it to see out of it. I mean, we can guess at it, but, you know, we, so there could be a lot of projection there, too, so. Was Saturn in any aspect to uh, Paris? I don't know offhand. I don't know offhand. I think Chad, I think Chad, I think Chad over, uh, Kieran has just come, has just come out with a little book on, on Eris. Okay. Uh, highly speculative. Mm -hmm. But um, I, yeah. the, everything you, you can know about it at this point is in that book. It should, it should be out now. I don't think it's going to be discerned much through natal stuff because it moves so slowly. Right. And so, like, these natal aspects, are, like, big swaths of people are all going to have similar aspects. Or, well, that's not necessarily true because the birth time can, you know, like moon aspects can really be different, you know, because moon changes so fast. But, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll see. We'll see. But if you project back in history of eras and, and aspects, I mean, what is what is this uh, cycle? I have a, I have oh well so so just so you know so eras is a really long cycle. It's like a, almost a five hundred year mm -hmm. cycle. So mm -hmm. it's like the combination of a Neptune Pluto cycle to get around the sun is like about a 500 year. And it's tilted, it's, um, so all the planets are like a pancake up through Neptune, right? It's all flat. And then with Pluto, it's kind of tilted like a little bit, I think it's like 17 degrees. In case of Eris, it's almost 45 degrees to the ecliptic. Actually, isn't Uranus's uh, no, plane, is the plane that Uranus ecliptic? Yes, oh, it's just the rotation. It's rotation. Oh, it's, it's, it's on the rotation axis, it's yeah. weird. It's horizontal. Oh, that's So it's going is. around like this. Wow. Okay. Like, of course, you're honest. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, but to come to, to to jump off of Eris and come back to the three the three centers, there just seems to be something kind of intuitively uh, obvious about it to me that there's something about the human anatomy and physiology that makes sense about it. There's something that makes sense about it in terms of modern discovery correlating and having kind of a symmetrical, symmetrical, right? See, one other thing I didn't mention in the talk is that, so the order of our evolution was just, you know, kind of all plutonic for such a long time, tribal phase, discriminating out Neptune, dis discriminating out uh, Uranus. So it goes Pluto to Neptune and Uranus, magic to mythical to mental. And then the discoveries symmetrically mirror that in the inverse, kind of in the inverse order. So then it goes from Uranus, discover Uranus first, to Neptune, to Pluto. So there just seemed to be a certain uh, beautiful symmetry there. So I, so I noticed that, and then just there's something intuitive about the body that felt very right with the sky element of Uranus and the light, and Pluto the body, and Neptune being so much about union. So I don't know where Eris would fit in with that in terms of like an energy center or some kind of higher capacity, maybe it's not non-physical, like subtle bodies. But my, my sense is maybe the, the, this, uh, this erratic character of the plane, and now you mentioned it, to me maybe suggests that it's not of the same order as the other planets. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you know, it's not just Pluto one, plus one sort of uh -huh. thing, which is what uh, Kieran is trying to do, I think, is mm -hmm. suggesting something else. Yeah. Yeah cuts across the plane. So mm -hmm. it's indicating something else. It's not, it's not this, it's not Most of the time it's not even the zodiac then, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's sort of outside of the... It's not in the zodiac. So how could you get right. the birth chart? Well, it only enters the zodiac at certain points of its... No, I think it's, I think it's, it, this is where the question of where is the zodiac comes up. Yeah. And the zodiac isn't anywhere. It's just a, well, it's just a view from us. No, that's it's just true. It's 12 degrees on either side of the ecliptic. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you, so stars are in, in the birth chart, but they're not in the zodiac, you know, depending on the declination. So the declination is, however, how, how far it, it uh, deviates from the ecliptic. That little band of 12, yeah. Yeah, so, so, there's a, so uh, all the planets are in the zodiac. They follow the ecliptic. 
but it sounds like Eris wouldn't do it. It would, it would traverse the ecliptic mm -hmm. at certain points in its orbit. So that's why I think it's different. It would be interesting to look at when it when its orbit crosses through the zodiac, mm -hmm. what sign is it in? You know, it brings out a whole new layer of, of indicators that, it, uh, that we could look for. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would leave out the entire constellation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering if each orbit, if it goes through a different um, constellation. Mm -hmm. Or if it's passing through the same channel. I don't think Karen mentioned that, actually, as I recall. I think we're up to something. <laughs> well, they're just different. They're different sort of principles to to apply, like principles of of whatever logic or archetypes. And so, one one principle that might be an intuitive principle that would be like a, a clue would be just so if we evolved Pluto to Neptune to Uranus, if that was sort of our, our the, the trope of our evolution, then the discovery of order in some sense is saying that for us to continue to evolve, we have to go deeper into the psyche of who we are to integrate what was left behind or lost or um, repressed or dissociated from or so we're moving forward by going deeper within so maybe there's some maybe that principle could be applied to people who want to research it and think about it so Eris would in some sense would represent a more primal dimension of humans or pre-humans that, that we've repressed or lost or dissociated from that's, that's deep, that's hidden, that we need to reintegrate now. That's, yeah. that's just an idea, a way of thinking. I don't know if it's accurate or not. Yeah. Well, one thing that I've heard Rick mention in talking about the planets, planet festivals outside of the orbit of Pluto is that it, it can be seen as reflective of this postmodern phase of having to deal with the multiplicity of meaning there, there are all these different possibilities for interpretation, and then all these. I mean, Eris is a little bit bigger than Pluto, right? Physically, yeah. Physically, a little bit bigger, but there are tons of other um, you know, planet festivals about the size of Pluto that are also orbiting out there mm -hmm. that have been discovered, you know, in the last few decades as well. So it's it's just an overwhelming amount of, of new data to have to find meanings for. And I think it can be seen as reflective of just the plurality mm -hmm. of, uh, of meaning that we're having to deal with mm -hmm. at this phase. Mm -hmm. It even fits the, the mythical character of Eris in a way having to do with chaos and mm -hmm. not being able to mm -hmm. put, put something in a box. It's just yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. I think when it was first discovered, it was uh, uh, Discussion on PCC chat about so what does Eris mean, and it seemed to me that one of the um, one of the things around the discovery was the question: well, what is a planet? Mm -hmm. So, planet, and this is also the right around the time of the the, uh, the first wave of discovery of extrasolar planets. So, in the late 1990s, but then at this point, we're discovering more and more extrasolar planets, and um, it's also uh, um, the, the bursting into the collective consciousness, you know, the big wave for the first time of uh, globalization, the anti-globalization movements and planetization. So I thought, well, maybe it has to do with planetary something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so mm -hmm. I was curious what, what the, uh, the transits would be going back. But I didn't see anything around 1500, for instance, mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, Paris and Can I ask about Vesta? Because like, Vesta is the only one of the, of the um, asteroids that's actually visible to the naked eye. So, where is it? I don't know where it is, but what I'm wondering is if it's visible to the naked eye, why didn't the ancients talk about it? Because they surely saw it. I mean, they saw everything. And it's, it's more massive than, uh, than um, Eris. I, um, in reading Steiner, he talks about the evolution of, um, I don't know what is the evolution of, but it's starting, we have the, the age of Saturn, then the age of the sun, then the moon, now it's the age of the earth, mm -hmm. and then it'll be followed by 
um, Venus, Jupiter, and Vulcan. And I was like, Vulcan? <laughs> and it was, um, they, they don't actually know, like the, a long time ago, um, it was thought there was another planet between the sun and Mercury that caused um, an irregularity in Mercury's orbit. And um, I guess astronomers have since figured out a way to explain Mercury's unusual orbit without the presence of another planet. But there's actually no way to see if there was a planet there because it would have to be um, viewed while the sun is in the sky. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe Steiner actually uh, knew that there was a planet in there. Mm-hmm. Just kind of it, just because he brought up um, Vesta, it's another planet that, or potential planet mm-hmm. that we can't know at this point. Does this make sense to you? Totally. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, good. Well, maybe we're, maybe we're out of gas. I don't know. I'm open. Probably to you guys usually. Depends. Um, yeah, it depends. It depends. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know if yeah. you were uh, going to ever distribute your presentation. Sure, yeah, I can definitely do that. Got a little bit more editing to do. Give me, give me three weeks. I can't read anything in the next <laughs> semester's <laughs> over anyway. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, since it's fresh in my mind, why don't I, why don't I talk about one, one more thing with Neptune? Yes. Okay. So, so I, as I was uh, researching, did my research for my dissertation. So, I mean, just, just to be clear, my dissertation focused exclusively on Neptune. Because I, I originally got fascinated by all three the all three discoveries, but it's just way too much for a dissertation. Even doing Neptune was yeah, way too much for a dissertation. I think it's Frank to leave a, a <laughs> five chapters in for the Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one of one of the most fascinating correlations with the discovery of Neptune is uh, the non-ordinary states of consciousness, and. Uh, so I did, did a fair amount of reading up on what was going on back there in the 19th century, and it's really, really interesting. So, so Neptune is discovered in 1846, and starting in the late 1700s, you start to see with Mesmer, and Franz Antoine Mesmer, and his, um, one of his leading students was uh, named the Marquis de Pisagur. And it was actually Pisagur who discovered hypnosis and called it magnetic sleep. And he, so he basically he's there in France, Pisagur is, uh, he was living in uh, Strasbourg. Uh, and he hypnotizes uh, this patient um, named uh, Victor Race was his name. He's kind of a, I think he was a young guy, like a teenager. And, um, and what Pisagur starts discovering in the late uh, 1700s is that he's, first of all, not only is he hypnotizing people and he's kind of healing them and he's getting them to essentially kind of heal them through opening up their unconscious minds. But he's also discovering that when he hypnotizes people, they have all these paranormal powers. Like they're clairvoyant, they're telepathic, they can read people's chakras and subtle bodies. And so they start, um, he would be hypnotizing these patients. And then he'd have other people come over and the hypnotized person would, would read the medical problems of the other person who was around, right? So someone would have these medical problems. So they, so they were doing a medical diagnosis through kind of like reading subtle bodies, uh, a hypnotized person reading the subtle bodies of the other person. Just to be clear though, that Victor and these people didn't speak in terms of subtle bodies. Uh, that, that's sort of the back reading of yeah, and they weren't using the word hypnosis, I mean, and they weren't speaking English, and, you, know, <laughs> and, you know, right, all kinds of things. But, but we would call it medical intuitive, in a sense, yeah. through, through in a trance state. So the idea, so the, the basic idea is that what I, when I was reading into the history, I was just noticing um, great, uh, a greater frequency of paranormal abilities, a greater frequency of exploring the subtleties of consciousness, right? Homeopathy is another good example of this. Homeopathy was invented in the early 19th century, a very Neptunian kind of form of medicine, right? You know, kind of dealing, you, you make the remedy more subtle to be more potent, right? And it's kind of a very Neptunian idea, right? You refine it even more. So anyway, as the, 
19th century starts, I was looking at other movements that, that had similar characteristics, and so I came across uh, the Shakers. Now, if people here ever heard of the Shakers or the Shaker communes, mm -hmm. I had never heard of the Shakers before I did the research for this dissertation, but man, the Shakers are really cool. And they had this, they had this kind, of, kind of glorious moment in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, they're founded by this woman named Mother Anne. And Mother Anne was um, uh, having, you know, kind of charismatic like powers, charismatic kind of contact in uh, England. And then she uh, left England, came to America, right, fleeing, fleeing religious persecution. She was even like, you know, put into a jail in England. And mm -hmm. So she was coming to America for the reason a lot of people, right, came to America back in those days, right, for religious freedom. And so these, she, she dies, but the Shakers, her followers, uh, have these, these communes. These uh, communes live uh, all over the Northeast. So, you know, Vermont, and New York, and Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, and stuff. And they're, they're celibate. There were uh, celibate communes. Um, so Neptune, Neptune, when taken to its extreme, can have a desexualized, right, kind of like to, to so pure, so pure, so sanitized, so clean, so watery that there's no sex, right? So there was a, it was a very uh, spiritual and Neptunian commune in the sense there was no sexuality, it was celibate. Uh, it was like it was very communal in the sense that everyone was sharing, everyone was equal, and they were having um, very very rich contact with the subtle dimensions, and. Uh, what I noticed in the research is that the, the people who've read up on the Shaker history say that in the uh, late 1830s, so again, this is sort of what's interesting about the research is that uh, what I was noticing in my research is that you would s I would see Neptunian phenomena that, that seemed to correlate with the discovery of Neptune um, as early as the late 1700s. But as you got closer and closer to the discovery of Neptune, it got stronger and stronger, more pronounced and more pronounced. So the Shakers are a really good example of this because in the late 1830s, as you're starting to get closer to the discovery of Neptune, they had what the, the Shakers called the, the Era of Manifestations. It was sort of this name that they gave. And it was sort of like when all this psychic activity just sort of went off the charts. And so these young teenage girls all of a sudden are talking to Jesus in the subtle dimensions and they're starting to, to talk to Mother Anne in the subtle dimensions and they... Um, they're doing all these uh, spirit drawings so where spirits are coming in and um, inhabiting the body of these young teenage girls and they're drawing these pictures of the of the heaven realms and the this is amazing. Realms. Now, this is like this is three years before the Fox sisters right well they date the era of manifestations from 1837 okay so it's all Fox years. sisters are 1848 so 11 years before, before the official group of scriptures yeah and uh, the Mormon Church during that time too. No Mormons. Yeah. Mormons. Mormons a bit later, I think, isn't it? No. No. Nope. Same time. Eighteen forties. Joseph Smith, Joseph Moroni. Okay. And yeah. up in New York, they were all doing something. And, and Andrew, Andrew Jackson Davis <laughs> is also in the eighteen thirties. Who's? No. Well, he's he's a little bit too young then. He. So let me just finish the Shaker thing. So the, so, just to to conclude the Shaker piece. Their window of history, where they, which they call the era of manifestations, it goes from 1837 to 1860. So right around the, the time that Neptune is discovered, they consider their richest, most abundant, most activated period of mediumistic activity, spiritistic activity, all this kind of contact with uh, subtle beings. Mother Anne came back in disembodied form and was giving these teachings through these young teenage mediums. So I was like, wow, okay, that's kind of a really interesting correlation, very Neptunian. Mm -hmm. So then um, another example is uh, the birth of spiritualism itself. And the, the Shakers were a small, fairly limited, fairly, you know, kind of countercultural uh, group. Spiritualism also was countercultural, but by comparison was really widespread. And the person that Sean just mentioned was like the the... There, there's, there was no doctrine in spiritualism. There was no, it was a very loose movement, and there was no guru, there was no main figure. But if there was like a central kind of key figure, it was this guy named uh, Andrew Jackson Davis. And he was uh, a young guy from, from New York, New York State, from Poughkeepsie 
area. And um, he was named after the president on the $20 bill. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so he's a teenager. And he's, living, you know, he's not educated. And uh, the, mes the mesmer, uh, mesmerists, right? Mesmerism started in France several decades previously, start to come to America in this period. So, so as a young teenager, uh, Andrew Jackson Davis gets mesmerized. Magnetized. Uh, magnetized by a uh, <laughs> traveling mesmerist. And it turns out he just has these really rich, robust uh, paranormal skills. So he uh, channels this 500-page uh, book, essentially, uh, called The Principles of Nature. And he's just sort of an uneducated peasant. And it's got all this science, it's got all this cosmology, it's this huge text. You including can, including a, uh, a, a description of a, of a new planet. And this is a few years before uh, Discovery of Neptune. Discovery of Neptune. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, just uh, so like, Spiritualism ends up adopting the, the esoteric cosmology that he describes in this book, The Principles of Nature. And then spiritualism kind of goes gangbusters after uh, 1850. Spreads all over America. Uh, seances. There were seances in uh, the White House during the Civil War that President Lincoln attended. Uh, President Lincoln's wife got very involved in the spiritualist movement. Um, and uh, there were seances here in San Francisco, and San Francisco was a gold rush boom town. I read, I read an account from a seance at my dissertation defense of just all this wild, off the charts, uh, psychokinetic phenomena, like chairs levitating, candles levitating, music, food, musical man. instruments, musical instruments being played by spirit beings. And what's so amazing about this literature is that it's really widespread, like it's not isolated, it's, it's all over the country, and it was in the White House for crumb's sakes. So it's just really interesting that around the time that Neptune's discovered, there's just all this spiritistic uh, and psychokinetic activity. Yeah. Yeah, so. You know, something just one we have to end, but it occurred to me while you were speaking, <clears throat> and it suggested also about these midpoint uh, uh, transits. It, in ecology, there's the idea of an ecotone. The richness of the overlap between niches, and um, so the overlap between uh, the Neptunian and the Platonic, for instance, is right around the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and that's where you have Freud and Jung, and of course Jung, Einstein, uh, and I Adler. But Jung, in, in, in his dissertation, right, mm -hmm. right at the turn of the century, which is on the psychology, pathology of so-called occult phenomena. Mm -hmm study of his cousin's transmedium spiritistic mm -hmm. phenomena. Um, so there's so and one and the other ecotone between the Neptunian and the Uranus is of course the full flowering of idealism of Hegel. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Just just a great thing. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice correlation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you yeah, did you, yeah go for it. another dimension I'm wondering about is if you looked at the charts of the astronomers who discovered which planet for correlation? I haven't done that yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something I just you said the um, era of manifestation uh -huh. um, in the Shakers uh -huh. started in eighteen thirty seven. Uh -huh. And um, that was there was a I think um, Jupiter Uranus conjunction in eighteen thirty seven. Um, it was an opposition, okay. Um, and it's that kind of like birth moment of mm -hmm. this very Neptunian uh, era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other critical world transits for that era? Meaning the entire 19th century or 1830s? Know, the, uh, 1837. The era of well, <laughs> Well, there was a Jupiter Uranus opposition at that at that at that time, mm -hmm. so, uh, like Becca was saying. Uh, my uh, <coughs> so the major. Well, first of all, my project was not to look at correlations, but to look just at this broad swath of Neptunian phenomena throughout the nineteenth century. Uh, but can you be more specific in your que in your question? Like, I was just wondering if anything that stood out to you. It's just such a fascinating phenomenon. Well, I'd say the um, the big correlations with 
the 19th century would be those two conjunctions that are on that handout. Mm -hmm. The first one, the Uranus-Neptune conjunction in 1821, and then the Uranus-Pluto conjunction mm -hmm. uh, is at 1851. Mm -hmm. I'd say those are the two big events of the 19th century. The conjunction of Neptune and Pluto is also really big, but it's so kind of such a deep, it's not, doesn't man, uh, correlate so much with outward manifest events so much as kind of a deep insemination of the psyche down below. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the Uranus-Pluto uh, conjunction right in the middle of the century is very much kind of correlates with a lot of what was going on. I think San Francisco as a city very much reflects the, that conjunction mm -hmm. being you know, found right at that time. Found Frank, what's your main source for the, uh, the Shakers and the, the, the um, era of manifestation song? Like, what's a good book? What? Well, the, the, a guy named Richard Stein is the big historian of Shakers. Is that I, what you went I didn't get my stuff from that book. I got most of my stuff from the Shakers from Catherine Albanese. Is that, okay, that one book that has so much. Uh, like yeah, Catherine Albanese wrote a book um, uh, called... Uh, Wayward Spirit? Oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name. So, uh, Catherine Albanese, uh, do, should I spell it on the board? Or? Oh, while you're spelling names on yeah. the board. <laughs> um, should we wrap it up? No, no, no. Uh, Pisica, is that the name? Yeah. How do you spell that? Yeah, sure. And isn't it interesting? Catherine Albanese, his book, uh, A Republic of Mind and Spirit. That's the name of the book. A Republic of Mind and Spirit. And what's neat about that book is that it's a history of esoteric religion in uh, the West, in, in America, in the modern American period. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's where I got most of my info on the Shakers. Pisagur. Pisagur. Yeah, well, you know French. Pisagur. <laughs> that's good. Pisagur. Oh, before you spelled it, I was like, it's like Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. Uh, the Marquis. <laughs> if, Mar the Marquis. If the, of kind of the, the Neptunian phenomena of the 19th century from a psychological point of view, the, the book that I think is fabulous okay. is titled um, From Mesmer to Freud, mm -hmm. and it's by Adam Crabtree. From Mesmer to Freud by Adam Crabtree. Really interesting history of the psychology, how psychology uh, evolved, that, and his book is very open to uh, non-ordinary phenomena. I don't know how much the Ellenberger book is. I, the I first read part it. of the Ellenberger, the first part of the Ellenberger book is very good. Yeah. It's a fat, fat book called The Discovery of the Unconscious. By, um, and so he, he talks about spiritualism and, and things like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone else have more questions or comments? Do you have any more you want to add? Thank you. Thank you for having me. I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 First get the Neptune book out and then work on it. <laughs> uh, you yeah. have like two other volumes or you yes. can just do it? <laughs> I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I'm really glad you have this film too. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.